Jesse Oliver is a passionate, uh, sorry, is passionate about engaging people with nature and saving species through eco ecology, science communications and environmental education. She learned that citizen science could do all of these while working at, as an educator at the Kernel Laboratory of Ornithology. Returning to Australia in 2014, she helped found the Australian Citizen Science Association and is currently their international liaison. Realising technology's role um, today in communications and information sharing, Jessie is currently undertaking a PhD researching how to create technologies that, both, that are both fun for citizen scientists um, and in, uh, informative for, the, in, for world, wildlife conservation. Over to you, Jessie. Okay, so um, I just was going to introduce Earth School to you guys, which is a collaboration with the United Nations and the, the Environmental Program. And if you've heard of the TED conferences and TED Talks, there's a TED Education branch that also has engaged people with all kinds of different education. And they put a call out for resources around education and within three weeks the globe came together with over 50 different organizational partners to develop what is now known as earth school and i'm going to share with you just a quick little promo video that encapsulates a lot of what ted ed does but also what our goal was with earth school <laughs> School. You can find that by just Googling Earth School or going to the um, ed.tedEd.com backslash Earth School. Um, Earth School is to engage people with nature in a wide variety of different ways, but using resources from a lot of different organizations. We were recruited to curate 30 different quests that engaged kiddos with different aspects of nature during a week long theme. So just to give a quick overview of Earth School overall, then I will jump into specifically the citizen science quest that I was largely involved with. So the first week was engaging kids with the nature of stuff. So how do the things that we use relate to nature? And there's five quests every week that were launched. And then nature of society was week two. And week three involved the nature of nature. So that's working directly to understand different natural processes. And then looking on week four with the changes of nature. And week five related to, okay, so there's lots of things happening with nature changes. How can individual people take action? And the final week was week six where it was collective action. So what can people do together? And that's where most of my work was positioned. And I worked with a really amazing team of people to explore, okay, not only do we wanna know what citizen science is, but how are there many different ways for kids to get involved with citizen science that relate to all of those previous weeks that we just went through. So we actually went through each quest topic and carefully selected and searched for different projects that had certain criteria. So they needed to be globally relevant and they needed to be projects that could be done at home because we were being very respectful of the global relevance of the pandemic. But we also wanted to give some options for people to get outside even if it's in their yards or do things through their computer or do things more tangible throughout the different weeks. 
So we ended up getting quite a lot of presence from media as well. And as you see here, this is Bill Nye and he endorsed Earth School, which was pretty phenomenal. But I think for me as an educator, the most exciting part of engagement was actually engaging with the kids and seeing what the parents were showing that their kids did. And we had collaboration through um, Little Scribe, which is an Australian company that provided mechanisms for kids to share things. But I also had two sisters from Germany share some of their creations with me through their dad directly through Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. And as you can see here, these all relate to different quests that the girl shared with me. But I took a lot of time to try and engage with all of the parents that were sharing things with the kids. And I would write directly to the kids because I think that kind of feedback, even if we're virtual, is really important to engage in them. And with citizen science, I believe that's true as well. So then we dove into developing our quest. And I had an incredible dream team of women that were all involved with developing the quest. And these were the four core people that were on every single conference call that we had to develop the citizen science quest. So for those that don't know, Caroline Nickerson is with the um, uh, SciStarter, which is a global database for citizen science projects to be able to find them, but they also have a lot of educational resources and volunteer management and different tools for citizen scientists, but also practitioners as well. Then there's me and there's Mary Ford, who's the education director for National Geographic. And then there's Ann Bowser with the Wilson Center. So let's dive into the components of the citizen science quest. So just to ensure that everyone was on the same page about what citizen science is and what its potential is and what it can do, we started out with a video by a guy named Tom Hanks and it's a really interesting video giving a very nice overview of the global context for citizen science. But then people were given the opportunity to watch some other videos that were targeted to introduce people to a few activities that they would later engage with. So iNaturalist is one of those projects. Also, there was the option to engage with the Earth Challenge 2020 air quality pollution project, as well as the globe at night, which is looking at light pollution. And then for people that wanted more information about different projects that were happening in a media context, we included Crowd in the Cloud, which is, all right. So um, Crowd in the Cloud gives some overviews of different projects that are happening in different regions of the world. So we included that too. In addition to that, once you finish watching a few videos or if you decide to do things that are more hands-on right away, you dive into the dive deeper section. And that's where you're introduced to activities like this amazing Frontiers for Young Minds journal which is actually edited by kids. So there's scientific articles that have been published, translated and edited for kids to really have meaningful engagement with real science because we were trying to convey the idea that if we really want to do science, we can do a lot more than just to contribute to existing projects, but we need to get some background information. Then we engaged people with the opportunities through a SciStarter hosted page to engage with a variety of different projects, as I mentioned before, that relate to each of the different quest topics. So we went through a lot of discussions to decide which project should be featured, to not give too many that it's just an overwhelming amount of projects, but they met our certain criteria that we had as well. And also they weren't too redundant, but they did tap into all those different topics as best we could. And you may notice there's two Australian projects. We have Virtual Reef Diver was featured as well as Wildlife Spotter. And both of those projects engage people with annotating or identifying different animals and substrates and aspects of nature in photographs. And then you see there's other types of projects like for example, the wild sourdough has been one of the biggest projects since COVID started because a lot more people are getting into baking. People could also make observations of nature with projects such as iNaturalist. And they could also, if they were from the younger group of people, try out Seek, which is specifically developed to be more accessible for younger audiences. 
And if they were interested in those online projects, there were other options than just terrestrial or um, marine organisms too. And they could also go outside at night and look at the starry yeah, night right. sky and document light pollution, which was quite interesting. In addition to those aspects, we then chose, okay, which ones do we have open access data to and can we create ways for people to actually visualize their data? Because we wanted them to engage with the whole process of science. With that in mind, I need to change screens very quickly. We then jump into, sorry, I'm just looking for the right screen creating data maps. And so this was done through the Wilson Center with the help of Esri and a lot of reviewing by all of us to create maps that actually plotted data from three featured projects of Earth School. And one of those projects, for example, was iNaturalist, but we targeted specifically so that we had nice looking maps that weren't just a total mess on looking at pollinators. So you can see we've got global contribution since Earth School launched, but if we just have a quick look at Australia, we can get a sense for the types of bees that people were contributing images of. So you can actually really have fun exploring all the different types of bees that we're seeing since, and this is all just since Earth School had launched. And so I just challenge you to have a look over at these graphs. And if you click on those two, you can also pick which type of bees you're looking at. So if you want to look at Apis, that's your common honeybee. And you can see the names over here. So there's Apis, there's the Bombus for the bumblebees, and there's lots of other types of bees, especially in Australia, because we have lots of different solitary bees as well. So I encourage you to have fun and have a look at that because it's really quite fun. And there's just so much information in here. And you can see here from the number of entries, that's an incredible amount of engagement with these maps. Fantastic to see. In addition to that one, we took that Earth Challenge 2020 map because also I should mention the Earth Network was involved with us as well. And they helped to promote this project in addition to some others. And you can click on this map similarly and have a look at the type of images of the air quality that people posted. And you can tell which ones are good because the green ones mean that the air quality was nice, but then those red ones mean that the air quality wasn't so good. And looking at air quality in this way, see now this is not a valid contribution. So some AI is gonna have to go through and pull out these ones that aren't valid, right? And this is actually a proof of concept project. So this kind of project is really important to understand how can we develop AI that help us to actually look for what is valid and what isn't. And then you can do combinations where you have people looking at them too, of course. And so the final project that was featured with data is quite different. It's looking at light pollution. Light pollution can very much affect different organisms around the world and it can affect us. So it's important to understand how much light is in the sky. And it's quite interesting how they work this one because you look just as the sun has gone down and it's nice and dark, but you look for constellations and you see how many stars you can count from those constellations. And you enter that data into the app. And again, here you can see who's contributed what type of information around what constellation they were looking at because it's going to change depending on what time of the month you're looking and also they have certain time periods where they have you look because if you look during a full moon you're not actually going to get as solid data as when there's going to be a very limited light from the moon so with that i encourage anybody to jump into earth school and Really, I want to convey that it's been really exciting to see that we've had over 200,000 people, young people contributing with these quests before we even finished. And now when I looked at the data today, we've had actually 400,000 quests completed through Earth School and it's still gonna be open. And I want to also just share with you that 
It is relatively new and it was developed over six weeks, which is an incredible amount of rapid development that occurred in that process. And it's not perfect in terms of the engagement because we just were in a real push to get things out quickly. But that's actually a benefit because over time, we're hoping that Earth School will continue. And as it continues, we can do new and exciting things with it. But feedback from people that engage with it is incredibly important. So I do encourage you, if interested in engaging with Earth School and getting back to me, look me up. There's my Twitter hashtag, or handle rather, and definitely sing up to me and share your experiences because I can definitely pass those on. So with that, I will take your questions. Okay, um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, I'm just gonna get my screen sorted out. Um, firstly, I have a uh, Abu2020 asks, uh, how can I make sure that that the science project I choose will be suitable for my student level. Student experience and knowledge vary widely. Absolutely, that's a really good question. And I, I think my best advice with you would be, you know your students better than anyone else would. So I think it would be important for you to trial the technologies yourself and see what works for you, but then maybe try them also with a handful of students rather than a whole classroom full and see how you go. I mean, because really we were designing this also for global use. And while we tried to put age appropriate brackets around all of the activities, and you'll see when you dive into the actual lesson structure of the quest, we did try to guess what age appropriateness would be, but you know your students better than us and we were trying to do it from a global context. Okay, I've got uh, Arj Khan um, asks, uh, can Earth School be ad adopted by community groups who cater for eight to 12 year olds? Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's open access. I mean, it's TED Ed, so it's up there and it's going to be up there and until we do something else with it. So, you know, iteratively designing it in future years if that happens. And a couple of different governments have actually put their hands up to support uh, different iterations. There's some really exciting collaborative considerations occurring in India and Canada both right now. And I'm sure there's more that I'm not across since Earth School development wasn't launching anymore. Fair enough. Well, thank, thank you for that. Um, we'll now move on to our next presentation. Thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, the next presentation is by Janet Anstey. Uh, Janet that is a researcher, sorry, is a research team leader uh, of the aquatic remote sensing team in CSIRO, CSIRO's ocean and atmosphere. Her current research is in the application and validation of bio-optical models uh, to enable imp improved discrimination of aquatic water quality and habitat where, optical, uh, where optically shallow. Additionally, she works uh, with computer scientists and engineers to deliver underwater proximal and remote optical sensing systems and solutions in Australia, um, but with a global application. She has had more than 25 years of experience in aquatic remote sensing, working with government departments, authorities, and um, subject matter experts. She is a, pa a passionate citizen scientist and leads the CSIRO's uh, Eye on Water Australia uh, project, which brings together her Earth observation skills and interests in aquatic systems with citizen science. She's the author of a number of journal articles, books, book chapters, uh, reports, and conference papers, and is currently uh, serving as the editorial on the editorial board of the journal Ecology Informatics, um, and is a member of the Australian Marine S uh, Science Association. Janet, thanks, John. Okay, remember. To get a shorter bio. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, thanks, Jesse. That was a really good talk um, and a good intro into my very specific um, app, and um, it, which is called Eye on Water Australia. And it basically is an app that is designed to look at watercolour. Uh, so we've, we've been uh, running that for, for a number of years. 
And we've had some success in implementing it into schools as well as community groups. So it's a very adaptable app. Uh, it can be um, very scaled back for very simple application to school groups and, and community groups. Uh, and then it can be scaled up if, um, if appropriate in those areas. But I guess one of the things that we're after in particular is to get people interested in observing watercolour and looking at what's going on in their environment around them. I'll just try and get my computer to work. It's not progressing. One of the things is, is looking at watercolour. You know, when we see, uh, ask people to observe water or ask them what colour is water, a lot of the times they'll, they'll answer that the colour of water is blue. And for a lot of the times when we're looking at clear ocean waters, it is blue. We'll see um, the photons of, of light being reflected from the water molecules back and they're usually the shorter wavelengths and it, it will appear blue to our eyes. When our ancestors uh, were um, uh, ancestors looking at um, watercolour in past times, they would often use watercolour as an indicator of things like water depth in these coastal waters. You see a, a particular green colour as you're approaching land. Uh, they would also use watercolour as an indicator of, of uh, perhaps phytoplankton richness and that would assist them in their fishing uh, industries. You would also see um, areas of inland waters where you have um, low flow conditions, um, high solar radiation and you have a build up of nuisance algae in these regions and this can have significant impact on on both our um, amenity of these, these resources, but also the economy. Uh, in places where we have um, uh, a buildup of algae, we can get particular species, like in this particular pond, microcystis, which is a blue-green algae, which can cause toxicity and impacts in, in health impacts in the environment. So in, in inland waters, we also have waters that have a, carry a high sediment load in their waters. And although this can be very natural and, and can occur uh, on a regular basis, it can also impact drinking water supplies and smother macrophytes. So in this example, the, the water actually appears very bright as the particles are, are being scattered um, uh, back from, into the to the sensor. In these waters, these are very yellow, um, clear waters, and they have a high concentration of dissolved organic materials. And this has a very high absorbance, absorbance in the UV part of the spectrum. Um, but typically, they're very clean waters, and they've been filtered by nature's um, by nature, going through usually the leaf litter in a catchment and going into the uh, leaching out a lot of the tannins from the leaves into the water column. So when we, um, you look around your own areas, you'll see rivers, lakes and coastal regions that have a variety of colours, not just blue, but a variety of colours. And so what we try and do is, is get people to identify the colours and relate that back to a particular type of water quality. When we, <clears throat> when we map um, water colour from satellites, um, we can actually see, because we've got uh, a lot of uh, collection of satellite data over time, we can see uh, features and processes occurring in the satellite imagery such as chlorophyll concentrations um, and turbidity over seasons or indeed over particular events. In my region around Canberra and um, in New South Wales, we've seen particular water quality issues uh, in the algal blooms around summertime, uh, seems to be a, a normal event uh, along the Murray-Darling region. 
But more recently, we've seen fire, um, bushfire impacts on our rivers. And these images down the bottom part of the, the graph here, or the, the images, show some of the sludge and um, resuspension of the, the pyrogenic material that has occurred over recent months. And this is having quite unknown uh, impacts in terms of uh, fish deaths, but also uh, impacts on other ecologies. So these are things that we need help with understanding the proximity um, and also the intensity of these events. Our project really uh, was inspired by a European project called Cyclops that ran in, uh, from 2012 to 2015, which really looked at developing low cost um, optical tool tools to link in the in situ um, sampling that was occurring in water, as well as the remote sensing that was going on with the satellite imagery. Basic ethos of the, the program was really to make sure everything was open access and that it was equitable for uh, access for everybody involved in the project, but also to develop different tools for different user groups because not every user group wants to put as much effort in as others. The whole idea was really to um, foster environmental science capacity through schools, community groups and different organisations. And it was, it was relatively successful in what it did. The amount of the different tools that they developed depended uh, on the amount of effort that was involved in, in at the most effort was um, doing 3D printing, producing little cuvettes for um, water samples to take fluorescent measurements. There was also an Arduino community doing it yourself, building uh, in water uh, devices to measure transparency. But by far the most popular uh, uptake of, of the tools was the Iron Water Colour app, where people were simply asked to go out, take a photo, compare the colour of the photo with the colour chart, and send the data in. And they had quite a large uptake. And that to today, that program is still continuing globally. And there are partners in Iron Water Australia. So our project, which had been running since 2017, really wanted to bring in uh, a network of citizen scientists. And we were really being remote sensors, we were really keen to select um, groups and 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 community organisations where we didn't have much information about what was going on in the, 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 uh, the regions. So what we wanted to do was increase, um, share knowledge about what we were doing and um, give information about some of the processes and the ecological processes that were occurring in their catchments or coasts and to, to share with them some of the uh, insights that we found from their information, which included calibrating satellite images and water quality maps. But to do this project, we really had to rely on a water colour index. So something that we could use both in the field um, with your uh, mobile phone, but also with satellite imagery. Now this Pharrell Yule colour index was actually developed in the late 19th century for use in oceanography and limnology. And so it, it's been used for a, a long time, but there was a paper that was produced um, in, in the 2010 that enabled us to actually apply this color scale to satellite data. Then later on in 2015, another paper came out that linked the satellite remote sensing colour scale with the citizen science scale. So that enabled us to develop an integrated approach to, to these, um, these observations. It works really well because the eye, our eye is actually one of the most sensitive detectors. When we do a comparative scale, a com comparison between a measurement and a colour scale, our eye is actually one of the most sensitive detectors um, on the planet. So it actually works quite well in that regard. 
So as I said, it's really linking in the smartphone tools that we get people to install on their um, devices with the in-situ uh, measurements that we take in the field and the satellite observations and bringing those together in some sort of framework. So as I said, the, the app has been operational in Australia since 2017 and we've been um, collecting data with citizen scientists around Australia since this time and you can see a number of measurements around Australia. There's actually a few more in more recent times and we've been working with various groups um, including school groups up in the Kimberley and in Canberra, uh, Perth and Brisbane. And we've adapted a bit of a program to uh, fit into their, their um, science programs. Usually it's at year eight or year 10. Um, and we, we give them uh, a little bit of uh, information and some, some devices to use as well in the field. So we ask them to take a photograph of the watercolor, match it to, to the uh, color chart and then upload it onto the, the website. On the bottom right, you can see a, a graphic of um, a section of the website where three measurements have been uploaded along a river. When you scroll in, you can see the three measurements. They've given it um, a Pharrell Yule index value of 18. And if you clicked on more details, there'd be more information there available for you to see. The, the pie chart up on the top uh, left uh, of the measurement details is a frequency of how often that the colour is uh, has occurred in that water body um, for the, all the measurements that have been taken. And you can see in, in this, uh, the darker brown colour is actually the most dominant, uh, most commonly occurring um, colour in that uh, region. So all of this uh, data is available for anybody to use and we use it to, uh, to compare to the satellite imagery. But if the user is particularly interested, uh, we can indeed supply additional, additional kit for them. And this can include a Secchi disc or um, other chemical um, titration kits or um, other probes for them to measure the water color or water quality. And this has been quite uh, popular for, for certain schools and we'll go out and often do an incursion with them to show them how to use this data and then organise an excursion to a particular water body that the teacher is interested in. We've also given some of this um, in, uh, kit to community groups and ranger, indigenous ranger groups up in the Kimberley for them to, to add on to additional measurements when they do field surveys. The app works, um, has, has a lot of information about how to take a good quality photo and uh, it asks the, the user to keep the, the app steady or flat so it's not at an angle, ask them to, to not take photographs of their feet or the boat and that sort of thing. And then it, um, it asks them to take a photo of the watercolour and then to select a portion of that photograph that is the most um, uh, representative of the watercolour. And then to select a colour from the colour chart that best matches their photograph. If the user is only doing um, the photograph, then they can just send that data straight up to the website. But if they've got other information, like from the Secchi desk or the, the other chemical um, kits, then they can add that data as well into the app and then it gets sent up to the, uh, to the website. The, there's an algorithm that we've developed that then calculates the colour, the the Pharrell Yule colour from the red, green, blue um, photograph that has been delivered to the website. And that uh, process is exactly the same process as we, we treat the satellite imagery. So we can then compare the two, 
to um, uh, data sources. The website um, is uh, um, hosted by CSIRO, it's on research.ciro.au. If you have a look at the observation tab, you'll be able to see the most up-to-date photographs, oh sorry, uh, observations of watercolour um, in Australia and also New Zealand. We've got quite a few coming, coming in through New Zealand. And if you scroll in a little bit further, this is um, in Broome, uh, you can see more and more measurements. This is actually a jetty down in uh, Broome. And if you click on one of the measurements, then you'll get some information about um, that measurement. And you can see the pie chart up uh, the top left here, gives you the frequency of the different colors that have been observed at that jetty as well as some additional information um, like pH and, um, and uh, conductivity that has been collected with this iPad. So when we want to take that measurement uh, and, co and compare it with the satellite data, we first have to convert the satellite data into the same color scale. So down the bottom left here is a, a Sentinel-2 satellite image of Lake Hume um, near Albury on the Victorian New South Wales border. And it's been converted into the Pharrell Yule colour scale. Um, so spatially you can see a variability through the lake from brown waters coming in to the east um, through to green waters going out on, on the Murray Arm. There's been some citizen science measurements taken at various points throughout the lake um, that then can be compared with the temporal um, distribution of the, the satellite data. So this plot up here on the, the left is actually the frequency distribution of the colors for each of the, each of the months. So it tells us something about the seasons. We can see it's more brown in the, the summer and autumn. It becomes greener over um, towards the uh, latter part of the, the year. The plot on the right has the temporal distribution of the, the colour in the lake. So each slice, um, vertical slice going through is a time where um, it represents all the colour in the lake. And we can see from 1987 through to, I think this graph goes to 2018, the, the changes of, uh, of colour in the lake. Um, it was browner uh, in the lake between mid-90s to about 2010, and then it became greener from about 2010 onwards. And that matches quite well with our knowledge about what's going on in Lake Hume and some of the, the algal bloom events that have occurred in recent times. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is take our citizen science data, at, um, it's got a time stamp, it's got a, a location stamp, and we can match it to specific locations and times in the satellite record um, for validation. In recent work we've done uh, we've converted every water body in Eastern Australia, um, whether it's a lake or a river or a coastal lagoon, into a time series of uh, colours. And we can now see the temporal distribution of, of those colours and see what uh, seasonal impacts are occurring in those rivers, lakes or, or coastal lagoons. And what we need now, of course, is citizen science, whoops, citizen science to uh, validate these temporal plots that we have of these locations. So we know that the ion water observations are really ideal for us to track these variations, um, but it, they're actually quite good to, to link back to anthropogenic progenic factors such as land use change. But we do need additional in situ observations to better understand those variabilities, but they are really ideal for us to, to, to monitor extreme events like cyclones, 
floods and ash flows and black water events. And in fact, um, one of the pivots that we've done earlier on in the year is to start using the app in uh, bushfire impacted waters. And with this newly released um, uh, fire intensity map, we can now start taking water samples and ion on water observations in these uh, catchments that have been impacted by fire and map the fire intensity with the water quality that we see in the catchments and our ion water apps. So I think that's all I've got. So um, thanks everyone for your attention. And I, hope, um, uh, I hope to answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you. Okay, so that's where I've got a series of questions for you, Janet. Janet. Um, uh, so we've got from, um, and I'm going to struggle with the, the name, uh, Faisa said, um, she asked, how, how, do we, how do you suggest we can implement uh, it during lockdown uh, with young, young children? Mm -hmm. And how can we help them feel that their findings are making a difference? Mm. Yeah, thank you. These, that's a really good question. I, the first one, first, I'm not so sure. I mean, most in Canberra, we're very lucky. We have a lot of uh, suburban works, um, systems that we can go to as part of our, uh, uh, our exercise regime. So I think that that would be um, probably appropriate. There's also the lake, which is another um, great water body. If anybody's been past one of the lakes in recent times, you'll see really big changes compared to you know, two months ago. So there's lots of opportunities in Canberra for us to, to see that. One of the ways to see impact is actually the, the uh, website actually shows uh, people's data and shows what's, what's, where it's being used. So it's one of those um, uh, uh, ideal situations where people can um, instantaneously see their data being uploaded onto the website and, and see where it's going in terms of satellite validation. I believe the question may have been um, based on the, the prospect of Victoria and Melbourne and whether it's something that um, kids could get involved with in the current, current situation. Yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, certainly keeping safe is the ideal uh, thing. I mean, we don't want people to go outside of their house when um, to take iron water photographs when it's not safe. So um, I, ideally it would be um, when things have, have uh, re uh, restrictions have um, reduced. Are they able to get involved in the assessment of the colours? of photographs that have already been taken? No, we don't have that as yet, but it's a good idea. Um, I would uh, certainly what we encourage is people to get online and look at ones where uh, there's been a mistake or somebody's taken a photograph of their feet or, you know, Jesse came up with that uh, air quality one where it's um, uh, not, a, it wasn't appropriate. So you can flag those sorts of ones. Okay, Mo moving on. Um, Stuart Harris uh, has asked um, some water bodies, including salt lakes, um, I've seen in Australia ex uh, express in colours, e.g. pink, yellow, et cetera, beyond the, um, the colour scales shown here. Uh, how would you observe, uh, how would you make observations of these water to be incorporated? Sorry. Yeah, look, I've only seen two water bodies that don't fit within the water, sc uh, that natural water scale. And that Pink Waters were uh, over in WA, um, and I think there's one down in Melbourne near a bridge. I've seen it go a pink algae, and the other one was black, black waters that I saw in Vietnam, and I didn't know, want to know what was in that water. <laughs> uh, it was black, but I've not, not any others that haven't matched that colour scale. But realistically, pink is not not a, a natural, it, it's not not um, commonly seen. And if they have, make observations of pink water, how would you suggest they um, flag it? 
Um, Question so on notice? Yes, yeah. I think probably around um, the COLA scale. Um, so probably, I would probably put it up um, around something like 20 and um, probably be flagged. Um, what happens is there's an algorithm uh, once the photograph is uploaded, uh, the, 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 um, once the, the actual device is recorded, so you, we can then convert the, the photograph that's taken from that particular device to a, a, a known reflectance scale. And at that point, if it doesn't then convert into a uh, Pharrell Yule index, then it's discarded. But it could be flagged if, you know, certainly sending me an email would be useful if you did one that was outside the range. Fair enough. Um, the next question I've got here is from Abu2020. Um, what are colour changes over different seasons? How can remote sensing data reflect uh, this temporal dimension of, of water characteristics? Um, and what calibration, uh, what calibration do you usually use um, to refine your measurements um, in water colour? Yeah. So for remote sensing, um, I've been <laughs> using primarily the Sentinel-2 data over the last few years. And comes over in eastern in Australia about every five days. We have a really large data set of measurements. Not every measurement is going to be valid because we'll have smoke, is cloud, and whatever. So you, if you're lucky, you'll get one one image a month. But that's actually enough to give you a temporal variability. Over time, it might not capture particular events, but it, it does give you a temporal variability and a seasonal variability. So, so you will cap that in satellite data. There's actually hundreds of satellites out there. Um, I tend to use the free ones that are, are publicly available. We can certainly build up a really large data set of, of information um, for particular water bodies. The second part of the question, how do I validate normally? Well, normally you re require a ground observation with uh, what's called a radiometer that, that measures the reflectance, the, surf the water surface reflectance. And that is then compared to the satellite data. The other way I could do it was, would be to measure something like chlorophyll concentrations or the suspended matter concentrations and then validate my models of the remotely sensed data. It's very expensive to do that and I can get one measurement for one location once and then it, it, I'd be reliant on other people to acquire that data when the satellite went over in other water bodies. So it would, it's very difficult to um, validate uh, your entire remote sensing scene. So this is one of the reasons that science is so important for satellite remote sensing. There is no way that we can cover the spatial uh, variability that um, a satellite image has without having additional help. Okay, um, the next question I've got is from Arj Khan. Um, how, can you, how can this project be elaborated um, by using a local creek uh, and study just one water body rather than a comparative study? Mm. Um, creeks are a little bit tricky in Australia. Um, this, this image, the, 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 the app is really reliant on um, having water where you can't see the bottom because you're, you're trying to color, not get the water color that's determined by the substrate underneath. Uh, so it really needs to have a, a bit of, um, uh, we call it op being optically deep, so you can't see the bottom. So creeks are quite tricky to do. There's other citizen programs that can look at, at creeks and Water Watch is one of those. Recommend looking at some of the um, ALA um, science projects that, that look at uh, creek health. For 
the creeks that go into water bodies like larger dams or rivers or, uh, or um, lakes, uh, then the Citizen Science um, Iron Water app is appropriate. Okay. Um, from S Sylvia Clark, um, how easy is it to extract data for a range of sites for regional monitoring purposes? Uh, so, can I just clarify, is that for from the uh, website or is it um, uh, extracting data from um, the app? So, uh, Sylvia, do you want to unmute and uh, just... Hello. Um, oh, either, I guess. The, the data is available from the uh, website. Downloaded as a CSV file, and um, uh, it you can have your data, everybody's data, or at, for your particular site, or for everybody's sites. So um, you can just do a small section or a large section. No problems to do that. Fair enough. Um, yeah, then we've got another one from uh, Abu 2020. Um, from your explanation, I've found uh, great answers to my questions, especially, uh, sorry, you're saying well done. Uh, sorry, they're, they're saying well done. Um, I've got another one from Fe uh, Feza Sayed. Um, uh, are we able to receive free kits for community work? Um, yes, uh, we, we, um, we've t only really given kits out to schools or, and um, some community groups with Secchi discs and a few probes. It, it depends on um, the interest, and um, but certainly I would be happy to be contacted for that purpose. So please make please contact me, and I can um, have a chat. Fair enough. And I believe your email address was in the end of your um, presentation. Um, okay. I believe we've covered off all the questions. Um, while, it, while your presentation has been going on, I will draw people's um, attention to some links that Jesse's posted up there as well. Is, are there any further questions from the floor, um, the, the virtual floor, so to speak, uh, for our two presenters this, this evening? So that, that being the case, and no one sort of waving their hands and so forth. Um, I might call the evening to an end. Thank you very much to Jesse and to Janet um, for their presentations. Um, I've certainly, I've, I've heard some of the presentations before, but I still learn stuff as, as each of them goes through. Um, and so thank you very much, one and all. Um, our next um, presentation uh, is the 1st of October, uh, where we'll be looking at uh, fire and citizen, citizen science involvement. Um, with a mix of scientists and citizen scientists um, presenting. Um, I would also draw people's attention. I can see your fingers typing, Janet. Janet. <laughs> there was like your yeah, keyboard. Um, I would also draw people's attention to all the other uh, National Science Week activities that are happening. Um, Libby was already was saying this evening that she's was got their first one underway. I, I note that Eden's got quite a lot. Eden, the Eden area's got quite a lot going on. I would, yeah, all that information is available on the National Science Week website. So you can search up uh, what's, what's happening. Anyway, thank you very much, ladies and gents. Um, I will, over the next 24 hours or so, I will forward out um, the recording of this evening's proceedings. Um, and so, yes, thank you very much for attending. Um, stay well and stay safe. Good night. Thank you.